Soundhound stock trading under the ticker SOUN has been quite hyped lately, and in today's presentation, we're going to distinguish hype from reality, which is about looking at facts. We're going to pay attention to red flags. That's what helped us navigate the more than 100 SPACs that we've covered, Soundhound being one of them, and we've been able to warn investors about these vehicles that have largely lost retail investors a tidy sum of money. And we're also going to set a price target for sound stock. So we've been covering AI for a very long time. And you can see here, Soundhound first came on our radar almost six years ago. So they were founded in 2005. That means they're nearly two decades old. Uh, they raised about 40 million through 2011 and then went quiet for a while. And the money started pouring back in. That started with a $75 million Series D in January 2017. That was fronted by leading AI chip maker at that time and today, NVIDIA. Now, this led people to believe that NVIDIA had purchased shares in this company relatively recently. And you can see uh, articles like this from The Motley Fool. This character says the investment was one of five that NVIDIA made in tech companies related to AI in the fourth quarter of 2023. That's completely wrong. And it's why the Motley Fool has no more integrity. I can't even take the time to vet the content churned out by instant analysts who aren't even qualified to speak about these sorts of things. NVIDIA filed what's called a 13F. And the reason they did that is because if you exercise discretion over $100 million in holdings then you're required to file that in publicly traded companies. Arm had their IPO in, what, September of 2023? And look, it would have brought NVIDIA's holdings up enough to where they would have had to file a 13F. And when you start to go down the list, people pointed out, for example, Nano X Imaging, $380,000 investment. Many of our subscribers have larger portfolios in that supposed investment in Nano X. This was because... Nano X acquired a company that NVIDIA was already an investor in. And if you can call $380,000 an investment, I suppose that would, that would be something worth paying attention to, but it really isn't. And we go down the list, we get to SoundHound. So SoundHound's, or NVIDIA's investment in SoundHound represents a small fraction of the company and a very tiny fraction of NVIDIA's cash on hand last quarter. It's entirely meaningless today, which is why that investment sits there doing nothing. Now, Soundhound was quick to capitalize on this by issuing a press release with a quote they wrangled out of someone over at NVIDIA Drive. And you just need to pay attention to the language and these sorts of things. So you see the big, bold headline here. But and when you look at what they're saying, that uh, today they announced an innovative in-vehicle voice assistant that uses an LLM completely on the edge while running on the NVIDIA Drive platform. So who exactly is powering who here? They say SoundHound's in-vehicle voice interface powered by NVIDIA Drive. Now, what matters here is revenue growth, and um, SoundHound certainly is not without revenue growth, but where does that come? Now, if we look at their SPAC deck, as I said, this was uh, one of many SPACs that we covered. Uh, it's always fun to go back and look at what they promised investors. Here you can see they're talking about $110 million in 2023. Well, they missed that by 58%. That's pretty much par for the course when it comes to SPACs. But I think this chart is uh, more important for investors in the company because it shows the contribution by revenue category. And back in 2021, 88% of their revenues came from product royalties. And you can see here, they correctly identified the importance of moving to a subscription model. Has that happened? No. Today it's gotten worse. So product royalties make up 96% of revenues. Why you want subscription revenues is that they provide more stability and predictability. And that's important to show traction in certain segments they keep talking about all this potential, like restaurants. So how they're recognizing product royalties is a point of contention that uh, their accounting firm has and certainly one that we picked up on. Now, the question you might want to ask here is because they have this great AI platform, they keep talking about how many clients are actually sticking around and using the thing. And I took this chart here from their uh, recent investor deck. And for a nearly 20-year-old company with an extensive list of clients, we'd expect that cons a customer concentration 
would be non-existent. So the product is so great, then customers ought to be using it, right? Now, before we look at um, retention rate and customer concentration risk, I wanted to ask your help. So if you're on social media and you see people asking about great YouTube channels to watch that help them become better investors by showing them how investing can be very risky and that most of the pundits out there are talking out their asses, then suggest this channel to your friends and family. Um, we help investors become better at growing wealth over time. That isn't something that happens by picking the next Microsoft. So you can use the share button on this video, please, and promote it across various social media channels. Uh, spread the word. Tell everyone about the Nanalyze brand. Thank you so much. So let's move on to talking about retention rate. So SoundHound defines this as a customer who purchased something in the current year and the year prior. And I found this verbiage to be rather interesting. They say, by contrast, if SoundHound provides an annual subscription contract to a customer, so you would assume then that like most SaaS firms, that's a subscription contract, and that customer does not execute an agreement for services for the subsequent annual period. What does that mean? They break the contract? This is a very odd thing for them to say. And they talk here about how in 2022, their customer retention rate, all right, so somebody who's been purchasing things year over year, was at least 80%. So in the SaaS world, think about gross retention right here. That's absolutely horrible. And whenever somebody says at least, you can be pretty sure it's it's capped right there. Otherwise, they'd say at least 81%, at least 82%. What's worse is we can't find this number in their most recent 10K, which points to other problems with their 10K we're going to talk about. Now, a showstopper for us is customer concentration risk. We've plotted that out here. And you can see that uh, one customer made up nearly half their revenues in 2023. So just a, a final point on that. For us, when you have strong customer concentration risk, um, that isn't something that we would get involved in. That's a showstopper red flag, and we would move on at this point, especially considering that slide we looked at that showed all these marquee names that are supposedly using their platform, none of which, or very few of which, appear to be paying the money. When we look at the 2023 revenue uplift, which means the de delta between 2022 revenues and 2023, so they were quite strong, that move upwards. They explain those, which is the way they do this is rather odd. So first they talk about, which at least they provide these numbers, a $2.8 million in edge solution, minimum guarantee licensing revenue with a Korean automotive customer for units to be utilized over the life of the contract. So it'll be interesting to know what that life of the contract is. What, what, how many units are we talking about here? More color would certainly be useful. They talk about an increase in unit-based product royalties of 5.4 million with various customers in Korea. So that's the country that accounts for mo most of their revenues. And that's certainly normal. But then they talk here about $3.6 million in a non-recurring voice data licensing agreement. So non-recurring, that's one of the reasons we want to see them growing subscriptions. And then they talk about this contract modification with the German auto customer, which reduced our estimated customer life, which led to a $1.9 million increase. So that's rather odd there in terms of how they're able to start playing around with contracts and showing revenue uplift. We're not the only ones that notice that. Uh, and then they say here an increase of $1 million in unit-based product royalties. Great. It would be cool to see uh, what sort of units we're talking about and some more color around that, such as their competitors provide. But things that we can deduce from those statements, for example, they said they had $3.6 million uplift for one U.S. customer. Uh, well, if you look at the chart here, it breaks these numbers down. It, USA revenues would have declined then, aside from that single non-recurring license agreement. Likewise, here you see if they had $2.9 million uplift from one German customer, then revenues from the Germans would have declined substantially. So um, what are we learning here what we're learning is that we need to start paying attention to cash flows very closely since there appears to be a lot of subjectivity in how revenues get recognized. Now, this firm has $109 million in cash left. They recently laid off 40% of their staff. That's a pretty big number. And, and usually for a company that's growing very fast and trying to capture market share, that's rather odd. Uh, and then if you look at the cash they're using, it appears that they have about 1.5 years of runway left. But 
they probably have more because you can see here they are generating cash from financing activity. So what's going on there? Well, you need to pay attention to dilution. So during the year ended uh, last year, they sold 25 million shares under the equity line of credit program and raised about $71.7 million. And they sold another 5.8 million shares under their sales agreement. And that has $137 million worth of shares left to sell. So when we look at their cash flow statement here, you can see proceeds from selling shares, selling shares, selling shares, issuing debt. So you're looking at dilution and the company taking on more risk with debt. And um, what I think it comes down to is that there are a lot more red flags than what we've covered so far. So for further reading, you can look at there's two short reports. I came across these uh, after compiling about 90% of this presentation, and I was surprised to see a lot of our concerns that we've uh, raised uh, mimicked by whoever these people are. We take short reports with a grain of salt, but some of the things they mentioned, SoundHound continually touts partnerships which seem to disappear. That's a huge red flag, and it's something we see with a lot of companies that really um, – are pulling the wool over investors' eyes. As we pointed out before, their speech recognition tech is a commodity service, and they're competing with some of the world's biggest companies, right? Um, they say here, to hide the fact they've lost key customers, SoundHound removed all customer names from the 2023 10K. Well, it's a bit concerning there. We didn't notice that, but that goes back to our point about if they really have all these great clients, these big companies, you'd expect them to be using the product. And they also say restaurants aren't making progress. They refer to the White Castle venture. Honestly, it smells a lot like Miso Robotics. Uh, they say that the agreement with Sonic has been swept under the rug. And what it comes down to is that uh, subscription services aren't growing, something that we were concerned about as well. Looking at the Capybara report, uh, there's some concerns here, some real legitimate ones. Um, they talk about bookings not being based on existing orders or contracted purchases. We've always said, especially in respect to SPACs, bookings are meaningless. They mean absolutely nothing because you can't prove, even if the company states they're contractually obligated, you can't prove that bookings are going to turn into revenues. Somebody correctly pointed out, said, well, you can't prove revenues are going to turn into cash. Well, that's, that's true as well, which is why revenue recognition is so important. And you can see PwC has identified revenue recognition as a critical audit matter in the 10K. They say here, management applies significant judgment in identifying and evaluating any terms and conditions and contracts which may impact revenue recognition. We just looked at that, for example, adjusting the life of a contract to increase revenues. Now, what's very concerning, we didn't note to this, is that in 2023, their auditor, Armanino, resigned and quit auditing public companies. And they said that uh, this firm was involved with a lot of failed SPACs. And one of the names on there was Momentus. I think in the history of covering SPACs, Momentus might have been the single worst thing I've ever seen come out of the SPAC movement. So the fact that they're using that same accounting firm is a concern. And uh, when they switched accounting firms, they were then suddenly unable to file their 10K on time. Not a surprise as uh, PwC then has to look for all the skeletons in the closet. And once they did, that included restated financials for both 2023 and 2022, which we noted. And uh, it also disclosed material weaknesses in internal control. So there are just far too many red flags for us to even consider looking at this company. Uh, for anybody that's interested in it, uh, you should certainly um, maybe wait a year for the dust to settle around the hype and the fact that a new accounting firm is trying to uh, find all the bodies. Now, I wanted to point to something rather fun here, and it's this site on spurious correlations that uh, produces a lot of these great charts. For example, here they show the sales of sour cream correlating with deaths from motorbike accidents. There's no, that's a spurious correlation. There's no reason those two values should be correlated, but it's a rather fun thing to do. And what they've also done is start to produce these fictional academic papers around their spurious correlations. Uh, and they even have generative AI coming up with explanations as to why these correlations exist, which sounds, to be honest, like a great Turing test. Now, we've noticed a spurious correlation in all the time that we've been researching, more than a decade that we've spent researching technology stocks. And that is that whenever a company is selling a large pool of shares to the public market, 
for some reason, there are loads of cheerleaders. Now, we're not suggesting that certain companies out there uh, get involved with selling shares and then have um, people go and try to uh, push them down retail investors' throats. We never suggest something like that. But uh, we have noticed that there are uh, several approaches taken by these cheerleaders, and we would suspect they're going to come around to this video. And uh, there's the beginner cheerleader. They'll scoff and dismiss the entire video is not worth their time. Uh, there's the intermediate level cheerleader. They'll copy pasta their bull thesis diatribe as if it's their own personal pulpit. Then you have advanced cheerleading. That's where they'll watch the video. They actually watch it and all the way through and find uh, one or two small inaccuracies to pounce on. So we're going to get this out of the way. We don't have a dog in the race here and we never short stocks. We're covering Soundhound stock because we've been covering Soundhound long before most of these 25-year-old life coach YouTube analysts could drink alcoholic beverages. So if you're somebody that has gotten this far and think to yourself, in the words of one of our legendary commentators, you're going to go all in on Soundhound with some canopy growth call options to take the edge off, then what price ought you to consider buying shares at? Well, we've plotted the simple valuation ratio for Soundhound stock over time. And as you can see here, it's quite volatile thanks to AI hype. Simple valuation ratio is simply market cap divided by annualized revenues. And um, once we chart that, we can see that the stock has traded below 10. So when we look at setting price targets or more like valuation targets, which you can then ascribe a price to, uh, when we do that here and say, well, we would only purchase Soundhound stock if we were to consider doing that at a simple valuation ratio of 10 or less, because it's likely to trade at those levels. Compare that to our catalog average of 6.5, it's still rich, but let's just go ahead and set that level. And if we did, that gives you a share price of $2.14. So uh, the answer, people always say, I want to know a price target for Soundhound stock. Well, the answer is not to pull some random route, round number out of our asses because it sounds good. Instead, we use valuation metrics to arrive at price targets. Now, as I said, you need to be very careful because Soundhound stock is undergoing a lot of AI hype, and AI hype right now is very real. And in this next presentation, we tell you how to avoid it. So please make sure that you're subscribed to our channel. Please send uh, our videos and, and sp spread the word of our brand to your friends and family so we can help everyone become better investors. Thank you very much for taking the time to watch this today.